His praise the Lord. Let's begin to bless the name of the Lord. Let's begin to appreciate him. Let's just say, Father, thank you for keeping me. Thank you, faithful God, for bringing me to the sixth day of September and bringing me safely to the end of that sixth day. Father, I appreciate you. Father, I give you praise. I give you glory. I give you honor. Father, it is only, only of your mercies that I am not consumed. I acknowledge that. Sir. I know it has nothing to do with my diet. Diet may help, but if you don't help me, Father, Lord God, I would be here. Father, Lord God, there are people who have eaten better food than me, but they are no longer here. But you, in your mercy, you have kept me on the wake up today. Let's begin to appreciate the Lord in your own words. How has God shown up for you? How has he preserved you in your going out and in your coming in? Begin to just say, Father, I am grateful to you. I am grateful to you. Thank you for your tender mercies towards me. <coughs> Thank you for your tender mercies towards my family. You have been faithful to us and you have been too faithful to fail us. Lord, we come this evening to just say thank you to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You are a good, good God. You are an awesome God. Whichever way I look, I see your goodness. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy that keep following me. Oh, I give you all the praise. I give you all the glory. You are a good God. You are a steadfast God, forever committed. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you that situations may change, but you never change. Lord, I thank you that I can rely on you at every time at, at, and at any time. I give you praise. I give you glory. I give you honor. Father, Lord God, I thank you that the different parts of my body function the way they ought to. I give you praise. For those that are not functioning as they should, Father, I thank you that for healing that is available by the blood of Jesus. Thank you for your provision. Lord God, there is no problem I have that you don't already have the solution. Way in advance, there is nothing that has surprised you. Nothing can ever surprise you because you know the end from the beginning. Even before the beginning, you know the end. Father, I am grateful to you. I come this evening to just appreciate you from the very, very depths of my being. I come to just say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Father, Lord God, I cannot overthank you. Because where, where would I where would I say, oh, I have thanked you up to and it is sufficient? There is no there is no gauging it. There's no bar barometer, there is no thermometer that I can use to say, okay, this is this is enough. It is full. No, 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 no. Your blessings towards me, towards my family overflow. Father, my thanks also ought to overflow. Lord, I appreciate you. Blessed be your glorious name. Father, we thank you even for the peace that we enjoy. Father, Lord God, that we have peace and we can worship you freely. We do not take it for granted. Thank you, faithful God, even for the facilities, the technology that we can use, that we have access to freely. Father, we give you praise. We give you praise. Thank you, faithful God, because you are the one who provides for us. So we're able to even pay our bills. We are grateful to you, Lord. Thank you, most holy God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We give you praise, we give you glory for, for who you are and all that you are to us. Blessed be your glorious name. We truly appreciate you. Let's commit tonight's service into the hands of the Lord. This is the first Wednesday of the month. Let us ask Lord God that this first Wednesday, Father, do a new thing in our midst. Let your word come to us undiluted. Let your word come to us untainted. Let there be a free flow of your spirit in our midst. Father, Lord God, we commit tonight's service into your hands. And we ask, Lord, that you take charge. Take charge of everything that we shall do. Take charge of everything that shall be said. Take charge, Lord. Take charge. We look up to you. We trust you, Father, that you will make a difference in our lives, even as you make a direct deposit of your word into our lives. Blessed be your glorious name. We thank you for all those who are watching, who are attending live, and we thank you for those who will yet watch the replay. Father, that you will bless each and every one of us. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. The steadfast love of the Lord never sees
at your feet. Father, we commit the entire service into your hands and say, just have your way. At the end of this time, let us know we have met with you. Let your word flow through undiluted into our hearts and let our lives be the better for it. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good evening, everyone. We thank God for his kindness towards us and we trust God that you and yours are doing well. The theme for this month is we are partners with God. We are partners with God. And it's based on 1 Corinthians 3, verses 9 to 11. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 to 11, and Hebrews 3, 14 to 16. Hebrews 3, 14 to 16. And I'll read both uh, scriptures first, and then we'll dig in. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 to 11, the Good News Translation puts it this way. For we are partners working together for God, and you are God's field. You are also God's building. Using the gifts that God gave me, I did the work of an expert builder and laid the foundation, and someone else is building on it. But each of you must be careful how you build. For God has already placed Jesus as the one and only foundation. So no other foundation can be laid. <coughs> so no other foundation can be laid. The Passion Translation says, We are co-workers with God. And you are God's cultivated garden. The house of he is building. God has given me unique gifts as a skilled master builder who lays a good foundation. Afterward, another craftsman comes and builds on it. So builders, beware. Let every builder do his work carefully according to God's standards. For no one is empowered to lay an alternative foundation other than the good foundation that exists, which is Christ. No one is permitted to lay an alternate foundation. You know, sometimes people tell you, oh, alternate medicine, alternate this, alternate route. No, it's not an option when it comes to being God's partner. Hebrews 13, Hebrews 13, 14 to 16, Hebrews 13, 14 to 16 says, we are partners with Christ, but only if we hold on to the confidence we had in the beginning until the end. When it says today, if you hear your voice, don't have stubborn hearts as they did in the rebellion. Who was it who rebelled when they heard his voice? Wasn't it all those who were brought out of Egypt by Moses? That's the common English translation. We are partners with God. That is our theme. Today, by the grace of God, we will be talking about we are called to be God's partners. But what are you? We are called to be God's partners. But what are you? We are called to be God's partners. But what are you? What am I? According to dictionary.com, a partner is a person who shares or is associated with another in some action or endeavor. Someone who shares or is associated with another in some action or endeavor. For instance, we say marriage partner, my reading partner, my, you know, my shopping partner. For some people, they have shopping buddies. In law, it is a person associated with another or others as a principal or a contributor 
of capital in a business or a joint venture, usually sharing in its risks and profits. In its risks and profits. When, you know, I was preparing, one of the things that God dropped in my heart was, there are also a few other ways that we can, shall I say, associate with God that also start with the letter P. That also starts with the letter P. And, um, you know, I mean, some translations, you know, when we say we are partners with God, some of them will say we are partakers. You will see participants. You know, there are different um, words that start with P. But today, we'll look at two and, you know, just dig in and ask ourselves. We are called to be partners with God. But what are you? Ada, you have been called to be a partner with God. But really and truly, what are you? are you? What's my role? The first one we'll look at is parasites. According to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, a parasite is an organism living in, on, or with another organism in order to obtain nutrients, grow, and multiply, often in a state that directly or indirectly harms the host directly or indirectly. There's some of us that may remember our biology. I, I had a wonderful time with the girls on Sunday. We were talking about the subjects we like and the subjects we don't like. And, you know, it, it, it was a very good conversation. And we we're talking about biology. Who likes biology and who doesn't like biology? Who likes science? And, you know, it, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. It's amazing what God has deposited in the lives of our children. So for some of us who may remember our biology, um, take one is an example, you know. Another definition of the word parasite is someone or something that resembles a biological parasite in living off of, being dependent on, or exploiting another while giving little or nothing in return. Exploiting another while giving little or nothing in return. Simply put, if you want to just, you know, put it in a few, in other words, there are some people that are good users of others. They behave parasitically. And there are some people, some of us, who are God users. And in the Bible, we see examples. We see examples of people who were either good users of others or God users. Or maybe even both. The first example we'll look at is Samson. Samson. Samson was a child of promise. Turn your Bibles with me to Judges 13. Judges 13. I'm watching the time. We'll, you know, we'll pick verses. Judges 13. Let's start from verse 1. The Bible tells us that, um, actually in verse 2, let's jump to verse 2. It says, a certain man from Zorah named Manoah. He was from the tribe of Dan. Manoah had a wife who wasn't able to have children. And then in verse 3 it tells us that the angel appeared to Manua's wife, to Mrs. Manua. After he appeared to her, he said, ah, you are going to have a child though. Make sure you don't drink any strong drink. You don't eat anything that is unclean. And so on and so forth, you know. The hair on his head must never be cut. And gave him, her some clear instructions. Ah. And even told, told him, told her what his career path would be. He didn't, he, he didn't just say, oh, you have a child. He said that this is what your child is born to do. That's the assignment for your child. Ah, she went and told her husband and said, come on. This is what happened to me. Breaking news. The husband said, ah, Lord, please send your servant again to talk to us. And 
The Bible tells us in verse 9 that God heard Manoah and the angel came again to the woman while she was, uh, but he was out in the field. Ah, she ran and looked for her husband. Oh, yeah, daddy. You know, some people call their husbands daddy. Darling, another D word. And, you know, the angel repeated what he said. And in verse 13, he said, your wife must do everything I've told her to do. Your wife must do everything I've told her to do. And then Samson was born. Verse 24 tells us later, the woman had a baby boy. She named him Samson and he grew up. The Lord blessed him. Verse 25, the spirit of the Lord began to work in his life. The spirit of the Lord began to work in his life. And as you continue to read about Samson, you will see God working in him and through him. And you will see situations where, you know, he wants to do something and the parents will say, no, 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 you shouldn't do this. You were not called to this. This is not acceptable, you know, by God's standards. But Samson, as far as he was concerned, I wasn't the one that delivered myself. God, you are the one that puts me here. Therefore, Samson was a God user. If you read through about Samson, you will find only about two places where Samson acknowledged God. And something, there was something common in both situations. Let's read them first, and then I'll tell you what was common. Judges 15, 18. Judges 15, 18. It says, now Samson was very thirsty. This was after he had killed some Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. And he said, he was very thirsty. And so he called out to the Lord. You are the one who allowed this great victory to be accomplished by your servant's hands. So it was like, Lord, you let me win. He wasn't thanking the Lord for the victory. He was um, stating a fact. Say, Lord, you are the one who let me accomplish this victory. Then he goes on. Am I now going to die of thirst? And fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? Am I? I mean. So he was issuing a query to God. The second instance we see him calling upon God is in Judges 16.28. Judges 16.28. It says, Then Samson said a prayer to the Lord. Lord, remember me. God, please give me strength one more time. Let me do this one thing to punish the Philistines for tearing out both my eyes. Each time he prayed to God or reached out to God, it was for his direct benefit. He wasn't seeking to do anything for the Lord. He was a God user. It was about his wants, not about God's will. It was about his wants. Proverbs 29.1 tells us that people who hate discipline and only get more stubborn, there will come a day when life tumbles in and they break, but by then it will be too late to help them. That's the message. Translation. NLT says, whoever stubbornly refuses to accept criticism will suddenly be destroyed beyond recovery. That's exactly what happened to Samson. He went into self-destruct mode because, mostly because, he was a God user. Even at the time he told Delilah the story of, you know, the locks, seven locks in his hair and all that. He assumed that God will always be there, whether or not he complied with God's instructions. Another example of a God user 
is Saul. King Saul. King Saul. In First Samuel, First Samuel mm -hmm. nine, when we get introduced to Saul, he and his servant were looking for his father's donkeys, and after a while, ah, in verse five. Saul said to his servant that, ah, we may have gone too far because very soon now, my father may stop worrying about the donkeys and start worrying about us. And then his servant said, ah, okay, you're right too. But let's just try one more thing. I, I know that there's this, there's a servant, you know, there's a king here that they really respect. I know that there's a king, there's a prophet, excuse me, there's a prophet that they really respect in this land. Let us try. Let us try. Let us try. Let's go to him. Because anything he says comes to pass. The things he says come to pass. So let's go to him. Maybe we will be able to, you know, find these donkeys. Let's not go home empty handed. Now, this is me ad libbing. I'm adding to that. But you find the full story in 1 Samuel. 9, 5 to 10. First Samuel. And then Saul said, eh, you, you think so? You think so? Okay. Eh, but we don't have anything to give him. So, at least Saul had some home training. He knew that you don't go to the servant of the Lord empty. You don't go to the Lord, more importantly, empty. And they said, oh, we have something. Then, in verse, 10, in verse 10 or 11. So I said, ah, that's a good idea. Okay, let's go. So they went and saw Samuel. And it was after, you know, Samuel met them. That was all divinely orchestrated by the Lord. And Saul became the first king of Israel. Then in 1 Samuel 15, 1 to 30, we won't read it because of our time. Samuel went to Saul and said, this is a message from the Lord. You are going to go and you are going to destroy the Amalekites. Kill all of them. Everything. Mano, woman, boy, girl, animal, whatever. He says, completely destroy the Amalekites. I'm reading verse 3 of 1 Samuel 15. Completely destroy the Amalekites and everything that belongs to them. Don't let anything live. Don't let anything live. Don't, and, and you know the interesting thing about this instruction is so that there was no doubt of the instruction. It goes on to say, don't let anything leave. You must kill all the men and the women and all of their children and their little babies. You must kill all their cattle and sheep and all their camels and donkeys. It was like everything. And so Saul went. And a lot of us know this story. He went. He came back. Verse 10, Samuel received a message from the Lord. Verse 11, the Lord speaking, Saul has stopped following me. So I am sorry that I made him king. He's not doing what I tell him. So Samuel was pained. He was angry and he cried all night to the Lord. And so the next morning, he went to seek Saul. In verse 12, it's interesting that Samuel went to seek Saul. And then when he got there, they said, ah, Saul, ah, he has gone to Carmelo. He has gone to set up a monument to honor himself. He has gone to set up a monument to honor himself. So he was going to pat himself in, on the back to say, I have done well. Uh -uh. I have done well. And so, Samuel went to where Saul was. And 
By the time he got there, Saul had just finished offering sacrifices to the Lord. That was what Saul was saying. And immediately he saw Samuel. Saul said, greeted him in verse um, 13. He said, the Lord bless you. I have obeyed the Lord's commands. Hmm. Verse 14. Someone was like, huh? So what am I hearing? What's the bleating of the cattle, of the sheep? And then Saul said, ah, it was the soldiers. It was the soldiers that took them. Now, the verse before, two verses before, had told us that Saul was giving sacrifice. Will the king be taking things from the people? The king will have his own. And, you know, Saul went on to tell the story. Ah, they kept the best of everything. No. The interesting thing was the choice of words. He said, they saved the best sheep and cattle to burn as sacrifices to the Lord your God. Not to the Lord our God. To the Lord your God. Not to the Lord my God. So as far as he was concerned, he had arm's length relationship with God. He was Samuel's God. And the conversation went on. And Samuel said, well, to obey is better than sacrifice. And he went on. He said, why didn't you listen to the Lord? Why didn't you listen to the Lord? In verse 19. In verse 20, Saul said, but I obeyed the Lord. I went where the Lord sent me. I destroyed all the Amalekites. I brought back only one, the king. Only one. I didn't even bring his wife or his children. Only one person. So, I'm sure he'll be like, ah. Of all the people I killed, one person is, that's the issue here. And then once again, he said it was the soldiers that took the um, items. And he now, finally, finally in verse 24, he said to Samuel, I have sinned. I didn't obey. He acknowledged that he had sinned. Then he now said, now, Come with me, let me go and worship the Lord. But Samuel said, no, you've rejected the Lord. You know, I can't go with you. The thing that interest, you know, that, that piqued my interest was how in verse 30, after everything that Samuel had said, Saul said, all right, I sinned. No, I'm saying it with attitude because I feel that he said it with attitude. It's like, okay, enough already. You know, sometimes there's some of our children when we're correcting them, you know, rolling eye. I'm sure Saul was rolling his eyes here. All right, I sinned. But please come back with me. Show me some respect. She has seen. This person has defiantly disobeyed God and is still looking for respect in front of the people. And they say, come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. Saul was a God user. He was a parasite. And he ended up a loser. We cannot afford to be God users. If we are God users, if we are parasites, we end up as the loser. May that not be our portion in the name of Jesus. Amen. The other word that starts with P, that we could, you know, associate with God, sometimes when we're not a partner, and hopefully not a parasite, we could be a pest. We could be a pest. A pest is a destructive insect. Or other animal that attacks crops, food, or livestock. Another definition is it could be an annoying person or thing or a nuisance. 
namesake so in the new testament he was a pest he was a pest we see Saul introduced to us in acts of the apostle verse one where um, actually before verse one in verse seven at the end and then verse one when stephen was being stoned and verse one of acts eight tells us that saul was in full agreement of stephen's murder and then it says at that time the church in jerusalem began to be subjected to vicious harassment everyone except the apostles were scattered throughout the regions of judea and samaria then in verse 3 the bible tells us saul began to wreak havoc against the church entering one house after the other he would drag off both men and women and throw them into prison then in acts 9 in Acts 9, verses 1 to 16, we see where Paul was like, ah, in fact, this territory, I, I need to expand my coast. I need to expand my coast. In verse 1, it says, Meanwhile, Saul, still breathe, still drawing his breath hard from threatening and, and murderous desire against the disciples, he went to the high priest and he got letters from the synagogue. And he said, wherever he finds anybody, he will put them. In prison and bring them you know well bind them in chains and bring them to Jerusalem in verse 3 the Bible tells us that as he traveled on suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him he fell to the ground and he heard the voice saying Saul Saul why are you persecuting me why are you persecuting me you can actually even change that word to why are you pestering me why are you persecuting me? Why are you being such a pest? Why are you being such a nuisance? And Saul said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is dangerous and will turn out badly for you if you keep kicking against the good to offer vain and perilous resistance. And... The story goes on about how he didn't know what to do. And Paul was like, okay, Lord, what would you have me do? And, you know, the light and everything. Paul was blind. He went into the city. He stayed with, um, you know, he was unable to eat for three days. He didn't eat or drink anything. And then the Lord sent Ananias to Paul, to Saul, before he became Paul. And when God was sending Ananias to him. He said, go, for this man is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and descendants of Israel. For I will make clear to him how much he will be afflicted and must endure and suffer for my name's sake. Saul was a pest until God arrested him and made him his partner. And Paul, converted from Saul, Paul is the person who authored 1 Corinthians, where our theme is from. And also people say he may have authored Hebrews. So he, 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 personally knew what it was to move from being a pest to becoming a partner and could confidently say to us, we are partners with God. We are partners with God. We'll talk more about being partners with God in the future as the Lord allows us. But the question I have for us is in our relationship with God today, if you were to assess yourself, are you God's partner? Or are you a parasite? A God user? Or are you a pest? 
dare I say, a God abuser. At every point in our lives, we are one of these, and I'm sure there are many other options. Are we just in for what we can get from God? Or are we there for what we can do for God? I want us to begin to pray for ourselves. And pray and say, Lord, please help me not be a parasite. Help me not be a God user so that I do not become a, user, a loser. Father, Lord God, help me. Forgive me for the times when I was a parasite. Help me not be a parasite. Help me not be a God user. Father, help me not be a God user because I do not want to be a loser. Father, help me not be a God user because I do not want to become a loser. Father, Lord God, thank you for your mercy that you didn't destroy me those times when I was a parasite. Father, Lord God, help me. Help me, King of glory, not to be a God user so I don't become a loser. In the name of Jesus. Pray for yourself and say, Father, forgive me for the times when I was a pastor. When I was a, when, when, when you know, with, with my words, with my actions, I may have been a God abuser without meaning to sometimes. Father, please forgive me. Father, please forgive me. Father, please forgive me. For those times when I wanted to do things on my own terms without caring about what you wanted. Father, Lord God, please forgive me. For the times when I acted like a pest, Father, please forgive me. In the name of Jesus, Father, please forgive me. In the name of Jesus, Father, please forgive me. I desire to be your partner. Father, please forgive me for being a parasite or being a pest. Help me become a partner. In the name of Jesus, help me become a partner. In the name of Jesus, in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. A lot of times we talk about the entitlement culture. Samson had the entitlement culture. He refused to listen to correction and guidance. We are going to be praying for our children. We are going to be praying for our children that our children will not be parasites or pests. We're going to pray for our children. Begin to pray for your children and children that are here. Please pray for yourself and say, Lord, help me not be a parasite. Help me not be a pest. In the name of Jesus. Father, Lord God, we lift up our children before you and we pray that they shall not be parasites or pests. In the name of Jesus. In their own way that they will partner with you. In the name of Jesus. Help them, Lord God, not be parasites or pests. In the name of Jesus. Isaiah 54, 13. Isaiah 54, 13. The Lord speaking there says, I will teach your children and they will enjoy great peace. They will enjoy great peace. Another translation says they will have great prosperity. Another translation says they will be successful. We are going to pray for our children that they will hear the Lord. Beyond what we say, that they will be taught of the Lord and it will stick Saul was taught of the Lord. That's how he became Paul and became a partner. He was no longer a God abuser. Father, Lord God, we pray for our children. Lord God, we pray that you will teach them yourself. They will not be hard of hearing so that they are not destroyed. In the name of Jesus, they will not be hard of hearing. In the name of Jesus, Father, Lord God, please help our children listen to you. Help them hear you and heed you. In the name of Jesus, help them, O oh Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. We are going to extend this because as I was preparing, what God spoke to me about part of the problem of Samson was he was marrying the people, that, you know, he went after the people that God said, do not marry, do not marry. We see a similar thing with another person whose name starts with S, Solomon. The Bible in 1 Kings 11.4 tells us that when Solomon was old, his plenty wives turned his heart away from God. We are going to pray for our children that they will not marry the wrong person. 
you will pray for your children. Say, Father, Lord God, our sons will not marry the wrong ladies. Our daughters will not marry the wrong men. In the name of Jesus, they will not marry who people who will draw them away from you. In the name of Jesus, Father, Lord God, our children will not partner with the wrong people. In the name of Jesus, Father, Lord God, you will lead them as they grow, as they associate with people. You will lead them to the right associations. In the name of Jesus, they will not marry the wrong people. In the name of Jesus, thank you, faithful Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. And so, Lord, we just want to thank you. Father, we thank you for your word to us. Father, we pray that you would help us to recognize that you have called us to be your partners. Father, for times when we have been parasites or pests, Father, please forgive us. Give us the grace to have a course correction. Let's no longer be God users or God abusers. In the name of Jesus. Father, we pray not just for ourselves, but for our children and all those in our sphere of influence. That, Father, Lord God, we will align ourselves with your will and your purpose. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, because we believe you have heard us and have answered us. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus. Offering time. time, offering time, time. please prepare your offerings and send it by e-transfer to kingsthronecalvary.ca at gmail.com, kingsthronecalvary.ca at gmail.com and please indicate what, you know, it's for and the Lord bless you even as you give to him in the name of Jesus. I give you glory, Lord, as I honor you. I give you glory, Lord, as I honor you. You are wonderful. You are worthy, O Lord. You are wonderful. You are worthy, O Lord.
in our whole lifetime. We just thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercies to us. Father, we brought our offerings to you. We ask, Lord God, that you accept us and accept our offering. Let it be used for the furtherance of your work here on earth. Let our lives be the better for it. In the name of Jesus. And help us truly, truly partner with you. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus. Thank you once again for joining today's Treasure Hunt service. Uh, please, let's be reminded that our one hour of early morning prayer, you know, for this week, continues tomorrow morning. So, one hour from 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. Mountain Time. 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. Mountain Time. And the phone number... 403-770-221. What's the number again? Oh my God. Okay. I'll put I'll put down the number for you. It's it just escaped me. I think I've I've called too many different numbers today. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 7682210. 7682210. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So please um you know join us and be part of the one hour special. And the Lord bless you even as you do so in Jesus name. Shall we share the grace in fellowship? And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Surely God's goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. May God cause his face to shine upon you. And may he grant you peace. In Jesus' mighty name.